Welcome back everybody. Now it is with great pleasure that I introduce our second speaker, Emma Mohammed. She is a very experienced primary school teacher and author of Quest, Macmillan Quest fi uh, 5 and 6 yes. and co-authored uh, the Macmillan primary course Heroes 1 to 4. And she's here this evening to talk to us about how to encourage our pupils at primary level to speak and communicate. So welcome, Emma. Thanks, Louise. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. As Louise said, it's about speaking. It's called Let's Speak. And it's about doing speaking activities successfully in our English primary school classrooms. Now, while I was planning uh, this webinar, I thought I'd better ask my pupils what they think about speaking activities. And so I gave a questionnaire to some year six pupils in the school where I work. I gave it to about 44 pupils. The first question on the questionnaire was to tell me what is your favorite type of activity in the English classroom? They could choose from reading, listening, speaking, writing, or doing grammar exercises. And out of the 44 pupils that I asked, the majority of them told me that speaking in English is their favorite type of activity in the English classroom. 35 out of 44 of my pupils said this. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means that a lot of our pupils are motivated to do speaking activities in our classroom. And we all know that motivation is really important when it comes to learning. So why then sometimes, as teachers, do we find speaking activities in our classes a bit tricky? I thought of some of the main challenges as I see them for us as teachers. Firstly, a lot of our pupils like speaking English in front of the class, but some of our pupils don't. Getting shy or weaker pupils to talk in English can be difficult. We need to think, how can we help those pupils? Secondly, managing the whole class can be difficult. What are the rest of the class going to do? while two pupils are doing a speaking activity. And finally, how can we add value to speaking activities? They are transient tasks. They happen in the classroom, and only we and the pupils see them and hear them. So how can we add value to these types of tasks for other people, like the pupils' parents, for example? So these are the main challenges as I see them and now I want to talk about some possible solutions to these challenges. To help shy or weaker pupils speak in English, I think it's really important that we have careful planning and staging. I think that we can use our speaking tasks as listening tasks, and this will help manage the whole class because everyone's got something to do. And I'm going to try and show some different ways of keeping a record of speaking tasks on paper in our pupils' notebooks or folders. So this is what the webinar today is going to focus on mainly. There are lots of different speaking activities we all do with our pupils. But today I'm only going to focus on three types. Presentations where pupils share information with the rest of the class. Role plays, where pupils take on the role of other people, normally in realistic uh, contexts. And finally, interviews, where pupils ask and answer questions in pairs. OK, let's get practical then. I'm going to talk about presentations first. And I'm going to talk about a presentation that I do with my Year 6 pupils, and you could also do with Year 5 easily. And after, I will show ways to adapt this task for lower levels, so that hopefully it's useful for everybody. Okay, so 
The task that I do with my year six pupils is ask them to present a dangerous animal. I say a dangerous animal because this makes the topic of animals a bit more mature for older levels. I've said that I think careful planning and staging is really important, especially for shyer or weaker pupils. So let's start with the stages that I go through. I give each pupil the name of a dangerous animal and then I ask them to research their dangerous animal online. I really like National Geographic Kids website. The address is on your handout. So they research their dangerous animal and they complete a chart. Then I provide a model for my pupils so that they know exactly what I expect them to do. Then I give them time to think about how they're going to do their presentation in front of the class. After all these stages, then I ask them to present their animal to the rest of the class. And as you can see, I put a photo behind them of their animal on the whiteboard just to give them a bit more motivation. While each pupil presents their animal to the class, I then ask the rest of the class to do a listening task. That way everyone is focused in the lesson. And for this activity, I ask them to listen and complete a chart. Now, I'm going to ask you to be the pupils listening to a presentation. And I'm going to ask you to listen and tell us after how long does a king cobra live? I've completed the rest of the chart. You only have to listen for that piece of information. Okay. Hello, I'm Jana, and now I'm going to explain you about the king cobra. The king cobra lives in the southeast of Asia. It is um, 500 centimeters long. It eats small mammals, lizards, and birds. And it lives for 20 years. Okay, so I asked you to listen and to send us your answer to the question, how long does a king cobra live? Okay, quick off the mark, they're very quick. Everybody's saying so far 20 years. Mm -hmm. 20 years, anything different? Let's just double check. 20, 20, Ooh, 20, 20, 20, 20, all the way down to the end. 20 years. Well done, brilliant, yes. Um, the king cobra lives for 20 years. I hope that was interesting to see what it's like to listen to a pupil doing a speaking activity. Okay then, and then we come on to the other aspect of today's webinar, how to keep a record of speaking activities. Now the great thing about doing a chart as a listening activity is that that chart can then be the record in your pupils' notebooks or folders. Here's an example of one of my pupils' charts. It's great because then after, when they look through their notebooks with their parents, for example, they can say, oh yes, this is when we all presented our animals. Oh yes, and my friend talked about the anaconda, for example. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so um, I think that we can do presenting an animal at all levels of primary school. I've just talked through what I do with my year six, year five pupils. Let's talk about how we can adapt this task for year three and four. With the higher levels, I give them a topic like dangerous animals. But with year three and four, I normally say, you choose the animal you want to present. And they normally choose animals like penguins, dolphins, koalas, animals like that. Then I've also asked them to research the information in groups so that each person is looking for one piece of information online. It makes it easier. And finally, it's worked really well when I've asked my pupils to present their animal in groups. 
So they all stand up together, maybe four pupils. The animal is behind them on the whiteboard. And then they each present one piece of information to the rest of the class. It's much easier to speak in front of the class with your friend standing next to you. And then with the lower levels, like years one and two, I turn presenting an animal into a game. Okay, Louise, so I'm mm. going to show you the game that I do. Okay. So imagine that we've been studying farm animals and pets. Okay? Hmm. Okay. Right? So then, after we've been studying them for a while, I take one of the flashcards of the animals that we've been studying, and I make it so the pupils can't see it. Okay. And then I model the speaking game to them. Okay. okay? Right. My animal is very small. My animal is white. It can run fast and it can jump. It can't swim and it can't fly. Guess my animal. Maybe it's a bit. rabbit. Smaller than a rabbit. Oh, it's I a give mouse. my pupils free, free options. It's a mouse. Very oh, good. Okay. A mouse. <laughs> and I show them the flashcard. And then I get them to come and take my role with a new flashcard. They are presenting an animal, but yes. they don't realize that they are because it's a game. Everyone else is listening because they want to win the game. Okay. Moving on then to role plays. I think you can do role plays with all levels of primary school, um, but I'm going to start by a role play that I do with my year ones and you could do with year twos as well. And then after, I'll talk about ways that we can adapt the same kind of role play, but for higher levels. Okay, careful planning and staging to help especially weaker and shyer pupils. These are the stages that I do. I provide a model so that the pupils know exactly what they have to do. And in this case, I use a video clip from Heroes 1, and I give them a simple task to do while they watch and listen, like, tell me what's on the pizza. So we're going to show you now a short extract of a video clip from Heroes 1 where they show ordering a pizza. This is my mum. Hello. Let's make a pizza, Layla. Do you like cheese, Layla? Yes, I do. I like cheese too, Mum. Lots and lots of cheese, please. OK. Mm -hmm. hmm. Do you like meatballs? Oh, uh, no, I don't like meatballs. Meatballs? Oh, yes, please. I like meatballs. OK. Mm-hmm. And do you like olives? No, I don't like olives, Mum. How about you, Layla? Yes, I like olives. OK. OK, so providing a model is really important. Then, I give pupils time to practice. This is also really important when we're planning a speaking activity. I get them to practice pretty much the same role play in pairs using a pizza base and toppings, normally in black and white, while they're practicing in pairs. So they're saying things like, do you like pineapple on your pizza? Yes, I do, or no, I don't. And then after they've had time to practice, then I ask them to act out their role plays in front of the class. This time I give them a pizza base and toppings in colour and I also provide a chef's hat because it gives them a bit more motivation when they're doing the speaking task. And as before, I give the rest of the class a listening task to do as the other two people are speaking. This keeps everybody focused. And in this case it's a simple listening task. I say, listen, what is on Maria's pizza? And now I'm going to ask you to do the same as I ask my year one pupils. I want you to listen to this role play 
and after I'm going to ask you to tell us what is on Maria's pizza. Do you like pineapple on your pizza? No, I don't. Do you like Gina on your pizza? Yes, I do. Do you like chicken on your pizza? No, I don't. Do you like meatballs in your pizza? No, I don't. Do you like tomato on your pizza? Yes, I do. Do you like cheese in your pizza? Yes, I do. Do you like uh, olives on your pizza? No, I don't. Okay, so I asked you to listen and to remember what is on Maria's pizza. So you've got three options. A, tuna, tomatoes and meatballs. B, tuna, tomatoes and cheese. Or C, tuna, tomatoes and olives. A, B or C. 100% tuna, tomatoes and cheese. B. Fantastic. And with my pupils, this is how I tell them the answer. When they were doing the activity, I put blue tack on the toppings so that when they put the topping on the pizza, it sticks on the pizza. Then I take the pizza so that no one can see. And I ask my class, what is on the pizza? And they put their hand up and they tell me what they think is on the pizza, what they remember. And then finally I go, well done, yes. On Maria's pizza there is tuna, tomatoes and cheese. Again, they listen because it's a game. Okay. And then finally, um, this is how I keep a record of this kind of role play. I take photos of them while they do the role play, normally on my mobile phone. I print them in black and white and I give them to the pupils. And then they stick those photos on a worksheet that I prepare for them, normally with speech bubbles showing the key language that they used in the role play. Because this is year one, I only ask them to complete the key language rather than all of the questions and answers. And you can see this provides a really easy record. If they look through their books or their folders with their parents at the end of the year, the parents can see exactly what they did and what they said. Okay. Um, role plays are great with all levels. And now I just want to talk about how we can make them a bit more challenging for higher levels. Um, so here, for example, is a, a speaking task that I do with my year four pupils. And first of all, we listen to a model of um, someone ordering food in a restaurant. Then I ask them to work together to invent their own dialogues in a restaurant. Then I give them time to practice before they act it out. Now unfortunately I haven't got a recording mm -hmm. to show you of this, but I have got an extract of one of my pupils' work and I thought maybe you and me, Louise, okay. could read it out yes. to them, yes. just so that people can see the type of thing they come up with when you give them a freer role play. Okay, so will I be the customer? Sure. Okay. Can I have a menu, please? Yeah, here you are. For a starter, what do you want? I'd like lettuce, please. Okay, here you are. Oh, what's this? I'm sorry, it's a worm. Change it. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's just a small part from one of their dialogues, but it shows you what they can do when you give them a bit of freedom to be creative and to invent their own dialogues. Weaker pupils or pupils that find English more difficult will stick more to the original role play. But those that want to take risks and find English easier, they have the chance to uh, be more inventive and to, to do more creative things. Okay, and finally, interviews. Um, I'm sure that we all do interviews in our classrooms. Um, I do, with all years, interviews where pupils 
uh, interview each other as friends. And these kind of interviews work really well to practice and revise language they've already learnt. In year one, the questions might be simple like, what's your favourite colour? What's your favourite animal? And then as we go up, they might change to things like, what's your favourite school subject? Why do you like it? And then higher still to questions like, where were you last weekend? What did you do last holiday? But today I want to talk about interviews where the pupils become imaginary characters rather than just interviewing friends. So for example, you could ask one pupil to be the interviewer and another to be a famous singer, or an interviewer and a cartoon character, or an interviewer and a survivor, somebody that has been stranded on an island. Uh, this is an interview that I did with my year six class last term and I'm just going to talk through the staging for this kind of interview. First of all, I brainstorm questions with the class. What would you ask a survivor? And I write the questions on the whiteboard. Then I get pairs to write their interviews and they use some of the questions off the whiteboard and invent their answers. Then I give them time to practice. Remember, that's really important when we do speaking activities. It can be a noisy part of the class, but sometimes I think English class has to be a bit noisy. And then finally, I get them to act out their interviews in front of the class. And you can see I gave the survivor a hat and the interviewer a toy microphone just to motivate them a bit more. Again, while they act out their interview in front of the class, the rest of the class have a listening task to do so that everybody is focused. And in this case, I ask a simple question. Was it a positive or negative experience that the survivor had? I just want to play you um, a recording of two of my Year 6 pupils doing their interview with a survivor so you can see the type of things they can do. Hello everybody, today we are going to interview a survivor. What's your name? My name is Paolova. Where were you? I was in the rainforest. What happened to you, Paolova? I was on a plane from Barcelona to Brazil and it fell. I was the only survivor. What did you what did you eat? I only ate bananas. What did you, where did you sleep? I slept on the top of a tree. How long you were there? I was there six years. What did you see? I saw a lot of mosquitoes, two tar two showers, five tarantulas and many birds. What did you do? When I arrived I don't know what to do, but I made a cabin. And it was horrible, Paulova. Yes, but now I'm happy to be in Barcelona. Okay, bye-bye, Paulova. Ciao. Ciao. Okay, so I just wanted you to hear an example of a Year 6 pupils doing that kind of interview with an imaginary character, rather than just interviewing their friends. Keeping a record of this task is simple because we ask them to write the interviews. So they then keep that written interview um, in their folder or in their notebook. And it would also be a nice idea to take a photo of them doing that role play and sticking it next to the written interview. It just makes it a bit more personalised. Okay. Um, at the beginning of the webinar, I talked about this questionnaire that I gave uh, some Year 6 pupils about to get their opinion about speaking activities in the English classroom. And the last question I asked them was to tell me what their favourite speaking activity was that they had done with me during the whole year. And the majority of those 44 pupils told me 
that their favourite speaking activity was the interview with a survivor. Hmm. And I asked them to tell me why they liked it. And I wanted to share their answers with you because I think they're really interesting. I'll read them because it might be difficult for you to read them. So I said, why was it your favourite speaking activity? And they said, because we did it in pairs and we decided all the things. Mm -hmm. Because it was creative. Because I like inventing the script. And I like working in pairs and I love acting because I like playing a role of somebody else. It's like doing a theatre. Mm -hmm. um, I think that these uh, reasons that they gave tell us something about speaking activities in our classrooms. Doing speaking activities in our classrooms can give our pupils the chance to work together, um, to be autonomous, and to be really creative. And I hope that that gives you and me, us, motivation as teachers to do speaking activities in our classroom. Okay, I've got time to sum yes, up. Yes, yeah? absolutely. Okay, so I just want to sum up the main points then of the webinar. It's about how we can do speaking activities with our pupils successfully. And I think that there are three things we need to do in order for our speaking activities to be successful. We need to have careful planning and staging. We need to provide a model for our pupils so they know exactly what we want them to do. We need to give them time to think um, about what they are going to say. And we need to give them time to practice before we ask them to do speaking activities in front of the class. This is especially important for weaker or shyer pupils. I think that speaking activities give us an uh, opportunity for doing listening tasks with the rest of the class. And that helps us control the whole class during speaking activities. Listening tasks might be a chart, a simple question, or turning the activity into a game. And finally, there are lots of ways that we can keep a record of speaking tasks. And this, I think, helps add value to speaking tasks in the eyes of our pupils and of other adults like their parents, for example. We can video our pupils and show the videos to our pupils or their parents. We can photograph pupils and put the photos in their notebooks. We can use speech bubbles to show what they said. And we can provide written up dialogues that go in their notebooks. Great, thank you very much. And now we would like to give you the um, audience an opportunity to comment uh, or to send any questions yeah. that they might, they might have regarding the talk, the content, the activities and the ideas put forward. So please send in your comments and questions now. We'll give you about 15, 20 seconds. Um, and actually, I just want to comment. Um, these ideas, they're so well structured um, and there are moments, I mean, there must be moments in the class where you can see, oh my God, the light bulb goes off and you can see the children really coming into their own. No, when that's, that's what I love about doing yes. these activities. Yes. But I have to admit, uh, last term there was a day when I knew I was doing that year one ordering a pizza role play right. with my year ones. And I woke up in the morning and I was feeling a bit tired. Okay. And I thought, oh oh, I wish I wasn't doing this activity, <laughs> I wish I was doing reading. Yes. But once I went into the classroom and we started doing it, the, the fact that the pupils love it so much, yes. actually, you can't help but get it, into it, it, it and it, find it, it exciting. Yes, and, and you just feed off it, don't yeah. you? Yeah. People are replying, so I will Lovely. focus on there. Um, actually, somebody's saying, could we see the video again? I don't know which video that, that is. 
But um, the thing is, what please remember that there is going to be a recording available okay. of this this webinar, so you will be able to watch it again. Um, Maria del Pilar is saying very interesting, Good. very useful. Thank you. Great ideas to put into oh, practice. Yes. Um, I think people have noticed the very practical um, nature of this talk. Um, there are a couple of questions. When do you think it is necessary to intervene and correct mistakes when they're speaking? I actually thought about correction when I was planning this webinar, but I realized correction could be a whole webinar in itself. <laughs> so I thought I, I can't go into it in too much detail. But I have thought about it, so I will reply a little bit. We've got yes, time? Yes, absolutely. So, um, I don't correct my pupils while they're doing the speaking tasks because I think it is quite difficult for pupils to stand up in front of the class. I would find it difficult. So I prefer not to correct them during the speaking activities. And normally I correct them after, but I do it in a general way. So I talk about general problems I noticed while they were doing the speaking activity. That way no one feels self-conscious mm -hmm. or bad. And, um, and normally I only, I try to only correct things that they should know, uh, things that we have studied. Mm. Because I don't want to discourage them from taking risks yes. Yes. And, and being inventive. So if they've made a mistake in something that is above their level in many ways, I'm not going to correct that. I will correct things that we have been studying. But as I said, in a general way so that no one feels bad. I hope that's, I hope that's yes. useful. Yes, no, absolutely, absolutely. I think they're very um, sound pieces of advice. In but order it could to be motivate. a whole webinar on, on It could be, it could correction. be, absolutely. Um, one person has a question, is, um, how many sessions do you need to um, do the survival interview? Yeah, so uh, actually I thought about that with, with all of them. I thought someone might ask that question. It, yes. it depends a little bit on your class. But of course, it doesn't all happen in one class. Yeah. Yes. So with the um, survivor interview, I did brainstorming of the questions and the writing up of the interviews. And then a lot of people also did practicing in one lesson. Mm -hmm. And then we did uh, acting them out in the next lesson. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it depends on how big your class is, um, how long it will take you. Um, I think you could take one or two sessions just to do the acting out um, because I think that that's valuable. But I'm not suggesting that we can do speaking activities all the time. You know, a, a big speaking activity like these ones, I would hope that we could maybe do them once a term. Yes. Yeah, and yes. then give give a few classes to yes. them. But of course, not in one, not yes. in one lesson. And the question related to that: When do you do speaking activities in the middle or at the end of a teaching unit? So it's kind of. Mm, yeah, I normally do them at the end. Yeah, I think it's a really nice way to to kind of round up everything you've learnt. So, like the ordering of pizza, we've studied the vocabulary for the toppings of the pizza already. And we'd also studied some of the grammatical language of I like, I don't like, do you like, yes I do, no I don't. So that was not new for them. And that way they, they feel more confident as well when they do the speaking activity. So for me, I normally do them at the end. Of a yes, unit. that would make sense. I always think it's mm. a nice way, no, to show yes. them everything they've yes, learned. Yes, exactly. It's putting it all together, isn't it? And um, I've got another question. We're talking about evaluating this activity. Which would be the ideal rubric? How you know w what would be the best way to evaluate it? I suppose is what they're getting. How at. evaluate the pupils? Yes. Ooh. Um. Well, I guess it would depend. You have to decide mm -hmm. what you're looking for. Yes, exactly. You know, I, are you looking for uh, correct use of grammar? Exactly. Um, did they use like correctly? Could be a rubric. Or are you looking for creativity? Exactly. And especially with my older pupils, I normally tell them what I'm going to be looking for when I'm listening. 
And another reason why I often record them doing their role plays is because I find that really useful to refer back to when I'm having to do something like assess their speaking. Exactly. Um, but yeah, I normally tell them, I'm not, so for example, with the survivor interview, we've been studying the past simple. So most of the questions were things like, what did you eat? Where did you sleep? And then the answers had to be, I ate bananas for three weeks, or I slept in a hammock. Now, when I was then uh, assessing their speaking, if you like, one of the things would have been, how well did they use the past simple? But I also think it's nice to give them the value of how creative were you, mm -hmm. yeah? um, how inventive were your ideas. So it really depends what it is that you mm -hmm. are looking for. And another person slightly related to that is, um, for you, is pronunciation important? Yeah, well, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, but we can't do everything. No. And um, again, when I give them their general feedback, on, um, on the errors they make, then I would probably correct pronunciation of things that we had studied. Yes. I think that's the key when you're giving correction, whether it be about grammar or pronunciation. Let's correct them on what they should know, but not on what is higher than their level, because we don't want to discourage them, and we want them to take risks, and we want them to be creative as well. Okay, and there's another question related to, to assessment, informative assessment, you know, what do you, what do you evaluate, fluency or accuracy? Imagine you, you, you evaluate both or both. depending. Both, but I think maybe these freer role plays, mm. we are talking about fluency a little bit yes, more. Yes, I think so. You know, I and there so. might be other more controlled speaking activities, the more normal ones yes. we all do in pairs. Exactly. Where we might be listening for so, accuracy more. Yes. So it depends on the type it depends, of activity. Yeah. Yes. And probably a mixture of, of both if we're doing a speaking activity at the end of a topic. Yes. And um, I just wanted to find, um, there was a comment from somebody about um, activities that they do in class. Let's just see. I've been doing, ah, yes. Martha is saying, I've been doing a very similar activity on animals with my grade five learners, but all their info, info sheets will be put together to make a book. Oh, how lovely. Isn't that lovely? Really nice idea. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so you can really take lovely. it even further, and it's a record for the whole class. It's like a class book. Yeah. And in, in my school, we, we do a magazine mm -hmm. at the end of the year, and we choose kind of a couple of pieces of work of lots of different things we do the, throughout the year. And so, for example, I'm just putting mine together at the moment. And uh, yeah, three of my uh, animal presentations will be going in there. Three of their charts will be going in. So it's a lovely idea to make a book. Fantastic. Yeah, a lovely record to Fantastic. keep. Fantastic. OK, well, thank you very much, Emma. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Thank you for sharing all your experience, um, your insights into pupils at this age group and how they learn and what they react. I think it's been particularly interesting um, seeing the feedback from your students, from your, your pupils. I, I, I wanted to share that with you because I thought that, it was lovely what That was said. lovely and, and mm. it's, very, it's very important you know, that we get feedback as well yeah. in our classes. Um, so thank you very, very much. And thank you to everybody out there, the viewers, for attending this last webinar in the um, online Teachers' Days for primary teachers. I hope you've enjoyed these series of, of webinars much and hope to see you again next year in <laughs> 2020. Thank you, Emma. Thank you. And, and thank you for watching. Yeah.